Hi everybody, my name's Tony Smith, I'm the Medical Director for St John. Um, I'm going to begin by apologising, I thought this audience would be 100% hospital staff and I wasn't expecting any ambulance personnel and I've um, developed a talk on what to do at the scene of road crash for hospital staff who come across one. So for all the ambos, I'm really, really sorry. This is going to be like teaching you how to suck eggs. For the hospital staff, um, it's quite common for hospital staff to come across a road crash but unfortunately it's not always dealt with really well. Uh, and there's all sorts of reasons for that. Your senses can be overloaded by sights, sounds and smells. It can be very disorientating, it's often dark. Um, there's an unfamiliar environment. There's often multiple patients and hospital staff often are unsure where to start. They tend to focus on their own area of expertise and that is understandable. And it comes back to, you were talking earlier about stress. When you're stressed, you tend to go to your area of expertise. And I well remember turning up at a road traffic crash where there was an orthopaedic surgeon who gave me a great deal of detail about the patient's knee, had completely missed the fact they had a flail chest because they were stressed and so they'd gone to their, their area of expertise. Um, they often have no equipment of their own and when an ambulance turns up, uh, ambulance equipment may be unfamiliar, and they have unrealistic expectations of what they're going to do. And this is one of the kind of key things that I'd like to get home. You cannot expect to do the things that you would do in a ward or in a recess or in an ED. And if you have unrealistic expectations of yourself, you'll end up being disappointed. And all of these things can lead to it being a stressful experience. And what I want to point out is that it doesn't have to be stressful. Well, it is going to be stressful, but it doesn't have to be so stressful. Um, and I want to focus on a practical approach, and I want to focus on an approach that you could also use if you just came across someone having a medical emergency or someone collapsed in the restaurant while you were having dinner. So first thing is ensure you're safe. And we always say that, don't we? We always say that. But I can tell you the number of times I've debriefed a job with a hospital person who didn't even think of their own safety before going straight into the scene. Um, assess the number for scene and severity of patients. So this is like a primary survey of the scene just taking the primary survey concept and putting it to a scene. Give us a call at ambulance and tell us what you found. Stick to primary surveys, prioritise the patients, focus on providing good basic first aid, because actually in the first 15 minutes, that's what makes the most difference. You don't need to get fancy. Coordinate your actions with ambulance personnel when they, um, when they turn up, and focus on clear, concise and explicit communication. And clear, concise and explicit communication is a skill which will help you in any situation, be it a road traffic crash, a cardiac arrest in a restaurant, or a choking. So, first decision you have to make is whether you're going to stop or not. This is just my recommendation to you. My recommendation is that if you're in a metropolitan setting, unless you've got very specific skills to offer, like you're used to dealing with trauma and recess all the time, there's usually very little value in you stopping. My recommendation would be not to. If an ambulance is on scene in a rural area, often in our rural areas, our ambulances are staffed by volunteers, uh, and um, often they will be grateful for your help, so I recommend you stop. And if there's an ambulance not on scene, start with S, A, B, C. S is for safety, A is for assess the scene, B is for broadcast to ambulance, because I couldn't have two calls, two Cs, couldn't have call, so it had to be S, A, B, C, and C is for coordination and communication. And as I've said, you can apply this to anything. If someone collapsed in the corner now, we could apply the same thing. So S is for safety. This sounds weird, but it works. Get out of your car and do nothing while you count to 10. And it, it feels like a really long time, but it's actually not, and it's just some time for you to take a big deep breath and calm down because taking another five seconds to enter that scene is not going to make any difference, but it's going to make a big difference to how flustered you are, and how flustered you are is going to make a big difference to how well you do. Be particularly careful at motorway crashes. You know the big trucks with the big flashing yellow lights at the back? Three or four times a year someone drives into the back of one of those without ever having seen the truck. So they're probably not going to see your car with its hazard lights on. So be particularly um, careful at motorway crashes. Park to protect the scene if required. Leave your hazard lights on. If it's safe, leave your keys in the car. Sounds a bit weird, but often we're going to want to move that car subsequently. So if it's safe to do so, leave your keys in the car. 
Pause and note hazards, carry your phone, delegate. There's usually millions of people wanting to offer help. So or millions, I'm exaggerating. There's usually lots of people offering help, so there's usually someone who's prepared to, um, to del be delegated traffic control. So A is for assess the scene. This is like the primary survey of a patient. So primary survey of, of a patient, we want to do a rapid assessment to find out what are the key things we need to know, which I really need to know about now in the airway, breathing, circulation or disability. This is the same thing for the scene. Walk the scene, count the number of people, note the number of people trapped. If they're still inside their car, they're probably trapped. Most people, the first thing they want to do is get out of the car. They don't usually stay in the car unless they've got a broken leg. So if they're still in the car, they're probably trapped. At this point, details are totally unimportant. How fast were they going? Have their airbags gone off? Were they wearing a seatbelt? It's all completely useless information. And in my experience, nine times out of ten, everything you're told turns out to be wrong when the serious crash unit complete their investigation. The speed they say they were going is wrong. Whether or not they were wearing the seatbelt turns out to be wrong. Who crossed the centre line, they turn out to be wrong. So just ignore it. And if at this point you've identified yourself as someone with some skills and knowledge, people will be coming up to you and providing you with information. Nine times out of ten, that information will be completely useless. Oh, there's, he stopped breathing. He's bleeding badly. And unfortunately, you just need to quietly, with politely, ignore all of that stuff while you take a look at the whole scene for yourself. Just visually estimate the patient's severity. You don't need to get into detail at this stage. We just need to know bad or, or really bad or not so bad. Um, and remain hands off. Look, if it's one motorcyclist into a tree, you can get hands on as much as you like. But if you've got a scene with five or six patients, the last thing you want to do is get hands on with the first patient. So at this point, just delegate stuff to other people. Push on that bleeding. Just keep pushing on the bleeding. I'll come back to you in five or so minutes. Um, and designate someone to group all the walking wounded together. This is particularly important at a big scene. Let's say it's a bus crash. Um, we we want to keep all the walking wounded together because if those walking wounded disperse into the crowd, it's really hard afterwards to work out who's a patient <coughs> and who's not a patient. Then we lose people. And, we, and it's quite, in big scenes, it's quite easy to lose the walking wounded. B is for broadcast to ambulance. This means just give us a call and tell us what's going on. Now, the natural tendency is to get someone else to do this. Could you call ambulance for them, for me? Um, tell them that I'm an intensive care nurse from Middlemore Hospital and that we've got five patients and one's got a compound femur and one's unconscious and one's a um, baby that appears to be seriously injured. They're not going to remember any of that. They're going to remember absolutely none of it. So that it's actually really worthwhile taking the extra couple of minutes to make this call yourself. Because again, if it's a motorcyclist into a tree, it doesn't make a big difference to us. But if it's a scene of six, seven or eight patients, and three of those patients are critically injured, getting that information early on will fundamentally change what we send to the scene. And so it's really useful information. The other thing to do is confirm the exact location. And it's really easy to get this wrong. You'll be surprised, again, you come back to people who are stressed. You would not believe the number of times people tell us that they're on State Highway 27 and they're on State Highway 2. They tell us that they're 15 minutes north of Mangataroto and they're 15 minutes south of Mangataroto. So just take an extra 15 seconds to look at your phone, turn your location on and see exactly where you are before you make the call. C's for coordination and communication, so coming back to clear, concise and explicit communication. Doesn't matter what emergency you're in, it's always going to make things go better. Um, just a little bit about the trap patient. Unless you are experienced, this is not the place for you to be. Now while, ambulance, uh, while emergency services are turning up, let's say there's someone who's unconscious in there, it's absolutely okay to get in there and hold the airway open. But once emergency services arrive, this is not the place for you to be. It's, just, it's like taking someone who's not used to being in the operating theatre and sticking them in the operating theatre. This is a very specialised environment. It's a great place to injure yourself. It's a great place to get injured. And it's, unless you need to be there, you want to be out. Particularly, you'll end up with glass in your pockets and glass in your shoes, and you'll end up ruining your clothes. Um, 
Just a little bit about the trap patient. We will avoid holding a bag and mask on a patient's face unless we absolutely have to, because you just get in the way of everyone who's extricating the patient. We avoid placing IV lines in the vehicle unless we absolutely have to, because they're easily removed during the extrication process, and they're particularly easily removed by fire personnel who are working around the patient. Um, we will keep all unnecessary equipment and people out, but pain relief, particularly for patients with multiple fractured limbs, is really important in this setting, and ketamine is a gift. Ketamine is an absolute gift in this setting, and as you heard Dan say earlier, we will be progressively rolling this out to our paramedics this year, so that at the scene of, for example, a crash, in future, it would be unbelievably rare not to have someone at the scene who's able to administer ketamine to the patient. I just want to talk a little bit about the cervical spine helicopters going to the right hospital and what equipment you might want to think about carrying in your car. Uh, you probably Who's not familiar with our approach to cervical spine immobilisation? It's okay if you're not familiar. People are mostly familiar. Okay, so I won't go to the, into this in detail. This is what we teach our, our personnel to do in terms of clearing the cervical spine. If you have rolled your car and you've been, you've been ejected from the vehicle, and you meet all these criteria, we will clear your spine. If you fall off your chair right now and you don't meet these criteria, we won't clear your spine. So it's mechanism independent. Um, and most patients, most patients that we go to can be cleared clinically. You're probably aware we're progressively de-emphasizing the role of the firm cervical collar. We've introduced cervical lanyards for identification of patients whose cervical spine has not been cleared, but in whom a collar is not placed. And I don't have any hard data, but I reckon about 80% of our uncleared patients now are getting a lanyard and about 20% are getting a collar. And we will progressively continue to de-emphasise, but not totally remove, the role of the firm cervical collar. And this is, um, well it's not ubiquitous, but it's pretty common around the world now where ambulance services are doing this. Um, we don't, well I can say we don't use tape, that's not true because people still do things that we teach them not to do, but we teach them not to use tape. There's no role for taping a patient down. Um, and we don't teach transportation on hard boards, we don't use the term spine board. Spine board doesn't exist, it's an extrication board. It's used for extricating patients. It's got absolutely no role in immobilising the spine. Indeed the worst thing you can do for an injured spine is to place it on a flat surface. The spine was never, ever, 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 ever designed to be flat. And we teach common sense with the uncooperative patient. Because if you've got an uncooperative patient that's not going to lie still, and they're going to fight like crazy while you try and put on a cervical collar, then actually your patient's probably worse off than where you were before. And the two most common examples of those are small children who aren't going to cooperate, and intoxicated and or drug adults who usually aren't going to cooperate. Um, helicopters, there's a, um, there's a focus, as you're probably aware, in New Zealand on helicopters. We have more helicopters um, for our geographical area than any other country in the world. Uh, and we're, no, we're not special in that regard. We've just got way more helicopters than New Zealand actually needs. Um, look, they do have advantages. We've, they've got lots of advantages, but they also have a number of disadvantages. They have substantially reduced access to the patient. So even in the biggest helicopter in New Zealand, which is currently the Sikorsky in Northland, you've still got half the space in the back of that than you've got in the back of the road ambulance. So you've got, what, you've got significantly limited access to be able to actually do things to the patient. And even, um, even with modern communication headsets, with the rotors turning, communication is limited. At night, light is limited because you can't interfere with the night vision of the pilot. And so that means in the back of the aircraft, what you can do to the patient in the back of the aircraft is substantially less than what you can do to a patient in the back of a road ambulance. And that means if you're going to put them into an aircraft, there is a disadvantage. And so the disadvantage of getting into the back of an aircraft has to be outweighed by an advantage in either taking them a further distance or getting them there somewhere faster or getting a skill to the patient faster. And um, when we recently examined a year's worth of helicopter work in New Zealand, we found that in 60% of cases where the helicopter was used, there was no advantage in getting skill to the patient, no advantage in transporting the patient to a hospital faster than would have been achieved by road. Now I'm not saying we shouldn't use helicopters, what I'm saying is you need to understand how to use them better. So in our experience it's really common for hospital personnel 
to give us a call and say, we need a helicopter, we need a helicopter, we need a helicopter. My advice to you is to say, don't phone us and tell us you need a helicopter, phone us and tell us what you've got. Because we have really good systems for determining what we're going to deliver to the scene. And helicopters take much longer than people think. Much longer than people think. They take much longer to get in the air than people think, and they take much longer to load the patient into the helicopter and take off than people think. Um, hopefully, this is now a well-embedded um, principle, but five to ten years ago it wasn't. And this is the principle of taking the patient to the right hospital and not necessarily the closest one. And we now have really good data on this. It's very rare that taking the patient to the closest hospital, unless the closest hospital is the right hospital, is in their best interest. And in fact, we've now got really good evidence that by taking the patient a further distance to the right hospital, and a good example would be the current spinal cord injury destination policy, where we may bypass two, three, or four major hospitals in order to take the patient direct to Middlemore or Christchurch, is substantially improving patients' outcomes. And so it's really important not to just think, okay, we're at a bad crash outside Taupo, so therefore we're going to Taupo Hospital. The only thing that Taupo Hospital can provide for a badly injured patient is a warm environment. Now, I'm not, I'm not, dissing, I'm not dissing Taupo Hospital, but Taupo Hospital doesn't have, the, um, doesn't have the facilities to deal with a badly injured patient. Now, if there's a reason to go to Taupo Hospital, like they need their airway secured and we can't secure it at the scene, then that's okay. But otherwise, if we go to a hospital that can't meet the patient's needs, all we do is delay them reaching definitive care, and there's very good evidence that the sooner they get to definitive care, even if that means bypassing other hospitals, patients do better. And the major trauma destination policy is designed to do this for all of New Zealand. What equipment should you carry? Well, that's what I carry in my car, but I don't recommend you do that. This is what I recommend you carry in your car. So all of this will fit in a little plastic bag. You're not going to be able to have those anymore. All of this will sit in a little paper bag <laughs> underneath your seat, and it can sit there for five years, and none of it will expire except for the adrenaline, but even that can expire, and it doesn't matter because five years later it'll be perfectly fine. Here's what I recommend you carry. Some gloves, oops, that's not going to work. Some gloves to keep your hands clean. Something to push on external bleeding. And I need to update this picture. What's missing that should be in this picture? A tourniquet. So you can now buy tourniquets online for under 15 bucks. They, will, you, they could sit under your seat for 15 or 20 years and still be perfectly usable. And so I recommend, I need to update this photo. I need to add a couple of tourniquets. Tourniquets absolutely save lives. There's no doubt about that. Um, a couple of cannulae, um, that's potentially for decompressing tension pneumothorax. Having said that, we're increasingly teaching our own staff now to do open finger thoracostomy for um, tension pneumothorax. You may not feel comfortable doing that. Um, some oropharyngeal airways that will help you keep an airway open. A torch, preferably one that you can attach to your head so you don't have to hold it, that helps you see in the dark. Some adrenaline that, te that uh, teaches you, doesn't teach you, allows you to treat anaphylaxis, severe life-threatening asthma, and can expire many years and still be absolutely fine. Um, and something to keep you visible, a $10, um, in fact, they're often in the $2 shop, but a, a $10 yellow jerkin from any placemakers. You can pull all of this together for under 20 bucks. It'll sit underneath your seat and it could go there for 10 years, and then you'd be able to pull it out You'd be able to keep yourself visible, see in the dark, compress external bleeding, and open an <coughs> airway, and treat anaphylaxis and asthma. And this will save, if you're going to save a life, this will save 99 out of 100 lives, which are potentially savable. Okay, so in summary, the road crash scene can be difficult, particularly for hospital staff that aren't used to coming across a road crash scene. It doesn't have to be stressful. Keep it simple. Remember, SABC. Safety, assess the scene, broadcast to ambulance, communication, clear, concise. Ensure you're safe, assess the scene for the number and severity of patients, give us a call, tell, tell us what you found. It doesn't need to be in, in big detail, but just knowing that we've got eight patients, two trapped, um, three critical, 
three moderate and, moderate and two minor is really useful information. In the first instance, just stick to primary surveys. You don't need to make it complicated. Stick to good basic first aid, opening airways, stemming external bleeding. That's what makes the difference to most patients. And then when ambulance personnel come, coordinate your actions with them. There is always a little bit of, um, how shall I phrase this? There's always a little bit of difficulty when ambulance personnel turn up and you've already assessed the scene because ambulance perso personnel are going to turn up assuming that hasn't been done. And so they're going to want to, they're going to, want to do it. And there is a tendency, you know how I said to you before, you announce yourself as someone who knows something, a whole lot of people start coming up to you. That happens when you're, when you're in emergency service. You rock up to the scene, a whole lot of people start coming up to you and giving you information and a lot of that information is not all that helpful. So there is a bit of, bit of tendency just to block it out while we assess the scene. So my recommendation to you is in this setting, if you start to use familiar language, ambulance personnel will listen to you. I'm Tony Smith, I'm an intensive care nurse from Middlemore. I've assessed the scene, we've got five patients. Three of them are trapped. That one over there is unconscious. That one over there has major bleeding from their, um, from their neck. They will start to listen to you. So try and use familiar language. Um, and keep to clear, concise and explicit communication. Um, I won't run through that because we've already done it. Thank you very much. Happy, happy to take questions. Do you mind if we have a little look at what you did in your cup? Sure. Oh, that. Nah. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's also, uh, that you might have noticed the picture's got a pair of gum boots in it. Because the first thing I would do, if I'm, my, if I'm not in my uniform, the first thing I'd do is take off my shoes and put a pair of gum boots on. Because I've ruined too many pairs of shoes. If you're not in the hospital, how do you get hold of the um, uh, You can order them online. Uh, I would never say to you that you should steal from your employer. <laughs> but, I, but, but I can say that oropharyngeal airways are very, very cheap. <laughs> and can be ordered online. <laughs> and adrenaline? Adrenaline is dirt cheap and can be got on a prescription. Adrenaline is kind of, I don't know what we pay for adrenaline, about 10 cents an ampule. Hey, Tony, I have a question about the adrenaline. Yeah. We're not supposed to do anything unless we've yeah. got yeah. 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 So, so under the current legislation of New Zealand, Unless you are a nurse practitioner, you would not be covered in administering adrenaline to a patient unless you were doing so under a standing order. But what I can say is that if you have administered it in good faith to a patient with life-threatening asthma or anaphylaxis, nobody is going to take you to task on that. And I can... Um, well, so I've dealt, I've dealt with a couple of cases where they haven't. Obviously, I can't reveal the detail of the cases. And I, I guess I, should, I use the word nobody. Never use the word nobody because there's always somebody. I think the chances of you being taken to task over that is very low. If you felt uncomfortable with that, just don't carry the adrenaline. I, oh. Where's that sort of ATP then? Giving, like, say, adrenaline. Oh. So again, I'd come back. I'd come back to that gen general principle. You know, we would, and I, and I can honestly say this from an ambulance perspective, we would never take someone to task for doing the right thing for the patient. Now, obviously, if we found a first responder carrying succinethonium for rapid sequence <laughs> intubation, we're going to have a really uncomfortable question. Uh, sorry, a really uncomfortable question, a really uncomfortable conversation. But you know, we're not going to. You know, something like adrenaline. Obviously, obviously, and again, I'm not saying you're going to steal it, because we can't do that. Um, but you know, you, so you can now. Um, you can obtain it on prescription. You can now um, over the counter 
in pharmacies you can get, so there's new, they're not EpiPens, there's a new formulation of adrenaline now available which is much, much, much cheaper than the EpiPens. But again, you know, the adrenaline is a nicety, the other stuff doesn't, doesn't need any of that and will save lives. There is a tendency to carry a whole lot of stuff you don't need. I must admit, as an as a anaesthesia registrar, I carried this massive big kit of stuff for years and years and years and years and years and never ever used it. And then the one time I did come across a scene subsequently and went, and went to use it, the only thing I actually needed in there was a pair of gloves and an oropharyngeal airway. You know? Okay, thank you very much.